birthday to my mother-in-law, Mary. Oh, happy birthday. Yeah. Octogeneration, isn't that right? Octogeneration? Sure. I'll Octo- buy that Octo- for Octo- a dollar. <laughs> I'll work on that. Today's word is... Right! Use it in a sentence. Who's yes. coming up today on the show? <laughs> <laughs> hey, today we have Idaho Lay Dominicans, John Keenan, Mike Turner. They are here in studio, ready to roll. We'll have Cooking with Scripture with Deacon Chef Lou Aaron and Catholic Counseling. Hosted by Sarah Lynch. Please pray for our priest specifically today, Father Julio Vicente, pastor of St. Edward the Confessor Parish over in Twin Falls. And pray for vocations as well. All this week praying for Sergio Rodriguez. He is one of the missionary servants of the word over in Jerome. Our parish of the week, please pray for Risen Christ here in Boise. And today we recognize St. Catherine of Bologna, who was my daughter's confirmation saint. Awesome. Yeah. Her sainthood is uh, one not known for public miracle. She used her talent for painting in the church and uh, lived a simple lifestyle with the poor Clares. We'll learn all about this 15th century saint later on in the hour. Before the show, we were trying to find images, you know, to put up on YouTube. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was rough. Oh, yeah. okay. She's like propped up in a chair. Yeah. Most unpleasantly. Yeah, okay. All yeah. right. We're do, do your own we're search. We're going to replace that <laughs> yes, with a lovely we're... image. Uh, March is still the month of St. Joseph, yes, and we're going to um, finish out this novena, which take, has taken us more than nine days to actually Love it. get through. In the name of the Father, Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. St. Joseph, by the sorrow of thy heart, caused by the fear of the tyrant Archelaus, and by the joy in sharing the company of Jesus and Mary at Nazareth, obtain for us that disengaged from all fear, we may enjoy the peace of a good conscience and may live in security, in union with Jesus and Mary, experiencing the effect of thy salutary assistance at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Name of the Father, Father, and the Son, Son, and and the the Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Morning Light News Time 703, 36 degrees in Boise, 31 in Twin Falls, 30 degrees in Grangeville. The woman charged with the failure to report the death of Michael Vaughn, the five-year-old boy who went missing from his Fruitland neighborhood back in July of 2021, has now been deemed fit to proceed in court. 35-year-old Sarah Wandra was declared mentally fit to proceed in a hearing Monday morning after being held at the state hospital in Blackfoot. She was arrested on November 12th at her home in Fruitland and has since been held in the state hospital. An update on Father Gabriel Morales, who is in a serious car accident in eastern Idaho over the weekend. Please come in to Father Gabriel in, to your prayers, offer him in masses, do something extra this Lent for his healing. He is in very serious condition on ventilation for a lung infection and preparing for several surgeries on his legs. He is currently unconscious. Our Lady of Guadalupe, please wrap your mantle around Father Gabriel. The final four for the 2023 NCAA Men's College Basketball Tournament is set this Saturday in Houston. The San Diego State Aztecs, representing the Mountain West Conference, will be facing off against the Florida Atlantic Owls at 4.09 p.m. Then the Miami Hurricanes go head-to-head against UConn at uh, 6.49 p.m. For San Diego State, Florida, Atlantic, and Miami, it's their first time in school's history for men's basketball teams to have made the Final Four. UConn is the early odds-on favorite to win the national championship. It's your day. Today is National Triglycerides Day. You'll need to know that number because it's also Black Forest Cake Day. It is National Something on a Stick Day. I'm thinking uh, chicken satay would be my personal favorite. Or maybe a marshmallow. Yeah. And National Weed Appreciation Day. And weeds are difficult to appreciate. I get it. Tomorrow is National Vietnam War Veterans Day. Thank you to the many men and women who served. Tomorrow is National Pita Day, Lemon Lemon Chiffon Cake Day, and Mom and Pop Business Owners Day, and Little Red Wagon Day. Come on, let's fix this little red wagon. I told you, fix this little red wagon. <laughs> Enjoy your day. Traffic and weather are next.
Support for Salt and Light Radio comes from Beacon of Light member Treasure Valley's home team. Have you been thinking about making your move to another home? If you also want to support those who don't have the basics of human needs in City Soleil, Haiti, then make your best move with your local team, Treasure Valley's home team, who has proudly founded the Kizito family, Haiti, USA, and we are serving the poorest of the poor in Haiti. Treasure Valley's home team is owned by Marie Fitzgerald, MBA, and licensed with Coldwell Banker. Good morning, light traffic. Your commute this morning is fantastic. The only slow spot I can see is a 55 coming out of Hidden Springs, connecting there to State Street, and then also connecting uh, State and Eagle Road. But the rest of your commute really looks quite lovely. And that is your morning light traffic. Cloudy in the Treasure Valley today, then a rain-snow mix tomorrow and Thursday with highs around 50, overnight lows mid-30s. Magic Valley, cloudy and mild today with a high near 50, then scattered rain and snow tomorrow and Thursday. Highs 40 to 45 with lows 30 to 35. Much of the same for the Camas Prairie, cloudy today, rain and snow tomorrow and Thursday. Highs mid-40s, lows mid-30s. 36 in Caldwell right now, Buell reporting 30 degrees. It's 28 out in Rupert. We'll take a short break and be back with our friends from the Idaho Lay Dominicans. Yes. May I order some different weather, please? That would be great, wouldn't it? Please? At least, yeah, the snow really For needs April? to go away. April needs May to be in the 60s. Yeah, 55 even. <laughs> 55, do I hear 50, do I hear 60? <laughs> 60 over there, I'm cleaning in the red. 65, going to break. Okay, we'll be back after this. Looking for a quality Catholic service provider or resource? Please support the Beacon of Light sponsors on Salt and Light Radio. These business owners financially support Salt and Light Radio because, like you, they believe in our mission. But they have businesses to run, payroll to meet, bills to pay, so they need your patronage. Please support those who support us and tell them that you heard their message on the radio. For a full list of Beacon of Light sponsors, check the resource tab of our website, saltandlightradio.com. Support for Salt and Light Radio comes from Beacon of Light members, Accent Funeral Home. Planning funeral arrangements while grieving is never easy. When you pre-plan with Accent, you ease the burden on your loved ones and ensure your final wishes are known compassionate professional care, and options to fit every budget. The website is AccentFuneral.com, and their phone number is 208-888-5833. Accent Funeral Home, Catholics helping our Catholic community. The Alaskan Cod has arrived. The Knights of Columbus at Our Lady of the Valley in Caldwell invite you to the annual Lenten Fish Fry. Along with the Alaskan Cod, which is breaded in the super-secret recipe and deep-fried or baked into perfection, There will be tasty plank fries and traditional coleslaw. Be there at 5 p.m. for early seats. However, the nights will serve until 7 p.m. each Friday during Lent. This delicious dinner coincides with Stations of the Cross starting at 6 and again at 7. All proceeds benefit community charities and youth programs. Tuesday morning means a visit from the Idaho Lay Dominicans as chapter members discuss current matters in the church and in society, as well as the charism and challenges of the Christian life. 709 Morning Light continues across the Sultan Light Catholic Radio Network. Thanks for joining us on this terrific Tuesday. Joined in the St. Gabriel studio by John Keenan and Mike Turner as we, uh, are we wrapping up our series on conscience? Wrapping it up. Wrapping it up. We are wrapping it up, and good morning. How are you? I'm well, good. Good. I just got back from Canada. I was saying, what, uh, what's up with the up. cup? With well, the, maple the leaf cup. On it? I, I, it, it, this is a Tim Hortons cup. Oh, that's and their famous coffee up there. Yeah, and instead of Starbucks, it's Tim Hortons. Uh huh. But there is really, in my opinion, there is no Tim Hortons is far superior. It's the best coffee I've ever drank. So, huh. really good stuff. Mm. So, if you ever cross the border, head to Tim Hortons. All right. I like that for so, a commercial. So they're, <laughs> there while their go. beer is a little skunky, the coffee is apparently out of this world. Yeah. Fantastic. And the maple syrup cannot be beat. And, and their weather, uh, well. <laughs> their bacon's pretty good, too. Yeah. No, I, I, what we want to talk about today and focus in and on is uh, our, the question of conscience and kind of summarize and finalize what we were talking about the last couple of months with regard to conscience, which you know, the moral conscience of, 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 human, of a human and what we need to do. You know, and conscience is, is that little voice inside of us that tells us what to do, to avoid evil, to do good, and, and it's, it comes from our heart. You know, the scripture says that the law is written on our hearts and in our minds, 
And it's this in this that God touches us. His voice comes alive inside of us. And as we exercise it and become and develop it and educate it more, we become more aware of God in our presence. And I think uh, that that's kind of the sum and substance of it. Um, but it's important to educate our conscience, to be, to be better, uh, at, to develop it through the reading, through prayer, study, that type of thing. Yes, this voice of God, it, it's sort of embedded within us. It's intrinsic to us. Um, but on the other hand, it can be fogged over. Um, and uh, as, as you know, John Henry Newman says, it's one of our, the greatest of our teachers, but also it's w- least luminous because it, it can um, fail to uh, always direct us if we get lost on our way in life. You know, we, we struggle with the effects of original sin that we have darkened intellects and weakened wills. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore, um, although we are, you know, incredibly blessed to have our conscience, it is also highly incumbent upon us to nurture it. Right, and that's very good because what, what happens is in formation of our conscience, we are actually attuning ourselves to the will of God because he does speak to us. And as it says in Psalm 119, he, his, the word of God is a light unto our feet. But the word of God, whether as we study it and develop and get to know into ourselves, becomes more and more in our conscience. And we hear this often said today, we must follow our conscience as if it was an excuse to sin. And there is no excuse to sin because God establishes a standard according to the commandments and says we need to live in accordance with the commandments. He also says in 1 John, if you, if you know me, you will obey my commandments. So it is a place where we can get to know God and become more virtuous and, and that type. There's been a lot said and in the last generation or two with regard to conscience. Um, uh, uh, Pope Pius XII had a statement in 1952 with regard to it, Lunum Gentium, and in, uh, at Vatican II, as well as Dignitatis Humanae, addressed this issue. It's deeply addressed in, in, in the, obviously, in the scriptures, particularly in the, in the catechism of the Catholic Church, at just a beautiful statement, <clears throat> paragraph 1776 through 1783 um, and 1790. I would just highly recommend that, you, that, that one touch on those. And it helps us become more virtuous and not become slaves of sin, to sin. Mm-hmm. Yes, the, uh, the, the discussion of, the, of Pius XII in 1952 that you mentioned, John, is, kind of, is very interesting because one of the things that he discussed there was um, sort of the modern notion of the autonomy of certain you know, uh, human endeavors like Art and science and business and politics, and they have their own rules. They have their own autonomy. They uh, follow their own inner workings, right? And and Pius also thought, oh, to a certain extent, that's true. But they are all they are all human endeavors, and as a human endeavor, they must follow the rules of human uh, morality. You know, right. and it was, uh, <coughs> you know, it wasn't too many years later, and you know, I don't want, want to say anything about the, the folks who, who made the decision. We had the, you know, the Land of Lakes conference when we decided that, oh, you know, Catholic colleges should, should strive for academic freedom because, you know, academic life is one of those human pursuits that follows its own rules. And, you know, re- well, regardless of the motivation, what we saw as, a, as an effect of that is that um, we sort of traded uh, listening to the church, to listening to the whims of uh, secular academia, and yeah, I think it follows an ancient uh, an ancient error was when you're trying to separate faith from reason. Uh-huh. You know, you've got faith and follows truth, and reason that follows and reason, and and uh, you're, those are not separate items. Mm-hmm. And it, we have to pay attention. You know, a formation is a well-formed mind in this upright and truthful, and it accords itself with reason. Obviously, in obedience to the faith, these are not opposed to each other. 
You know, it was St. Augustine who said, beautiful statement, he said, a man, though a slave, is free, but a wicked man, though a king, is a slave, mm -hmm. for he serves not the man, <clears throat> one man alone, but what is worse is the many vices that he that is his master. That being, in other words, when we don't have a well-formed conscience, and we don't follow our conscience, we don't listen to it, and we simply obey the, our whims uh, of the day or of the world, i.e., the conference you just talked about, the agreement, then we're following in error. And that's, I think, part of the biggest issue we have today is so many talk about their conscience and following our conscience. But what does that mean when it's not well formed? That means that we can do what we want, when we want, how we want. Is that really the morality of God? And we might, you know, overestimate our own abilities to apply uh, what we know about right and wrong to uh, the circumstances that arise in our lives, you know. Um, so, for instance, we, you know, with the dawn of the pill in the early 60s, um, people weren't really sure what to think about this because it's not sort of a mechanical obstruction, sort of a chemical thing, and so maybe it's all right, you know, and they just they couldn't figure it out. Well, then uh, Pope Paul VI made a pronouncement in 1968 that, no, it's, it's not licit um, to use, use the pill for contraception. And at that point in time, um, we as um, Catholics um, say, say, well, when my reason is incapable of of sorting through all of this, I must fall back on obedience. <laughs> and uh, so, so the, the, the church is um, the light which can guide us in our uh, conscience formation because, you know, quite frankly, some of the decisions that we have to make in life are, are, are difficult and we think that we're going to just be able to work it out. Um, well, I, I think your point, with, your point with regard to the church is the, is the truth in light of the truth, is really critical because it's what gives us that light, that light unto our feet to walk. Mm -hmm. And it teaches us to avoid the type of technology that avoids the wisdom of God, that avoids the morality of God, but follows the morality of God. And you just gave that contrast between the pill and what Pius or Pope uh, Paul VI had said in Humanae Vitae. The point being, we're dealing with this issue more than ever mm -hmm. in our tech technocracy is where all of a sudden we have a situation where morals don't matter anymore. It's just what can we achieve in science and absent morality, sans morality. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we stay with it. We see this in the IVF uh, technology and, and in the upcoming IA uh, technology or AI technology, artificial intelligence, and this kind of thing that's developing. So it's cloning. Cloning, all of this is done uh, sometimes in without morality. And the church is, is the lamp that teaches the truth, that gives us the education, that aids us to step forward uh, in life and be assured of that wisdom and gives us actually the confidence, confidence with faith in God, in other words, confidence to walk in faith and right and uprightly. And I think and we can be truthful and that type of thing. Conscience is critical. And, and it's, it's helpful when you see a man or woman with conscience step into the public arena and say, ladies and gentlemen, this isn't right. I agree with progress. I have no issue with progress. But what you're doing here, whatever that issue is, is no. And one of them, for instance, is abortion. The idea that we can kill a kid in the womb violates everything that is the norm of society and I'm not even talking about God, but when you can actually that kind of violence in the womb that violates the conscience uh, and where we suppress that, comfort, that conscience to the point where we kind of numbed it is really kind of tragic in our modern era. So I think at the end of the day, we look to no longer be saved, slaves to sin, but to be free. Mm -hmm. And we need truth, accord with reason, and live according to our right conscience. Mm -hmm. So in addition to our, you know, our <coughs> darkened intellects, we also have our weakened will. Yeah. And 
one thing that we you know we've talked a bit about the need for for instance the examination of conscience and and i would say in in general one needs to have an active prayer life you know we say um, and i detest all of my sins because of your just punishment most of all because they offend you my god who are all good and deserving of all my love where is my love god deserves my love does he have my love um, <laughs> that's part of the reason you know for the prayer life is to develop a sense, you know, of, of, of intimacy with God, um, without which um, we can say we know it's right or wrong, but I'm going to go ahead and do the wrong thing. <laughs> because, um, you know, my, the basis for my keep making my decisions needs to be, to some extent, um, well, it needs to be depend, uh, based upon my loyalties and, and where, does my, where does my loyalty come from? You know. Well, you know, in, in closing, I think one of the things we may deal with in the modern era is this, I'm going to follow my conscience, and mm -hmm. conscience be my guide, and, and the church teaches we must follow our conscience. But it still doesn't free us from guilt when we commit a sin. It doesn't let us go from that. It's not an exoneration of guilt or sin. It's actually we begin to condemn ourselves when we fail to form our conscience correctly. So it's, it's key to adhere to what the church teaches. And one of the areas to do that is pick up the catechism at, at paragraphs, uh, you know, 1777 through 1790 and read it. It'll help you understand. It's a beautiful, short rendition mm -hmm. of the freedom of conscience that we have and can adhere yes, to. Yes, yes. You know, St. Paul in the letter to Ephesians says, you know, um, that uh, we have been given the wisdom to understand the mysteries of God. Uh, okay. Is that me personally? Have I received the wisdom? I think, no, it's corporately the church has received the wisdom to understand the mysteries of God. Exactly. If I start relying too much upon my own wisdom, I'll fall short. Yeah. Next meeting? Next meeting is the third Saturday of April. Um, we're going to have an inquiry class. Uh, those who are interested in the Dominicans in late May, I'll, we'll announce that here in the next few weeks. 10 a.m. at St. Mark's. 10 a.m. at St. Mark's. April 15th. Yep. Yes. Fantastic. Idaho Lay Dominicans, John Keenan and Mike Turner kicking off this terrific Tuesday edition of Morning Light. We'll be back with more in two minutes. Sultan invites you to listen and learn during this two-minute snapshot of the catechism. Here now, Executive Director of Mission at St. Augustine's at the University of Idaho and author of the book, The Catholic Company Man, Eric Meyer. You ever come out of mass bored? I mean... Sometimes you can't remember the gospel, sometimes you can't remember the readings, and a whole lot of times you can't remember the homily. But you know, you're backed in to a great parking spot, and if you get out of there quick, you can beat the traffic. The Catechism has a lot to say about the Mass, and it might change our viewpoint. If we start with this concept of holy sacrifice, paragraph 1330 in the Catechism says, the holy sacrifice, because it makes present the one sacrifice of Christ the Savior, and includes the church's offering, the terms holy sacrifice of the mass, sacrifice of praise, spiritual sacrifice, pure and holy sacrifice are also used since it completes, again, since it completes and surpasses all the sacrifices of the Old Covenant. The mass sets us up so that the Old Testament is satisfied and the New Testament can live with the face of God being Christ himself. 1345 continues, it's called the Mass, this section entitled and headed the Mass of All Ages, paragraph 1345, talks about St. Justin Martyr in the second century basically lining up exactly what we do in Mass. The document is called the Didache, it goes back to the year 155, so we've literally been doing this consistently since the year 155, whoa, I mean everybody wants to be part of something timeless and classic, and we've been doing this for 2,000 years? It's right under our nose. We should be tailgating for Mass. Keep listening throughout the day for more insights into the Catechism of the Catholic Church right here on Salt and Light listener-supported Catholic Radio. Change your station, change your life. Learn more at saltandlightradio.com. He's the owner of Westside Drive-In. Order up. And a deacon at Our Lady of the Rosary Parish in East Boise. 
time now for Cooking with Scripture as Chef Lou Aaron provides you with the most delicious Bible study you'll ever hear on the radio. 725, Morning Light continues. You're listening to Salt and Light Catholic Radio on a terrific Tuesday. And Chef Lou Aaron joining us now in the St. Gabriel studio with all kinds of pictures and delicious food and wonderful well, I forgot Bible this was lesson. radio. I thought we were on TV. <laughs> well, we are on YouTube. But when you're driving down the road and I start talking about stuff, like, look at this, look at that. Yeah, look people at are this. going, look at this. Who is this guy? In your imagination, yeah. vision. Yeah. But we do want yes. you to circle back later and watch the show on YouTube where yes. you can see all of our wonderful things that we have. I brought you several pictures. I just I just thought a camera, date. Camera three, please. A, a date palm tree is so pretty. And I brought you a picture of one. It's just beautiful, yeah. beautiful trees. Dates. That's a date tree. We, we've mentioned dates for several times. You know, I have to keep up because, you know, sometimes when I bring food in, like the item of food that I bring in may only be mentioned once in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Well, dates are a different story, my friends. They are mentioned over 50 times in the Bible. Wow. All over the place. They were prolific. So we, I brought dates today, and I made you some date banana bread, date bars with a lemon frosting, and there's dates and almonds. and. We've been making a lot of banana bread at our house as well. I like bananas. It's, it, it feels like the right time of year. Well, that was my question is, you know, now we have apples and bananas, even kids' songs about apples and bananas. But back in biblical times, the date was, like, the most popular type of fruit? Pretty popular. It was, I mean, that's where they got their sugar. Right. I mean, most of the date sugar that they ate was from date sugar. Uh, that's what kind of what I made this bread with was date, a combination of date and coconut sugar. Um, you know, they used the entire tree, too, the bark. The leaves, obviously the leaves are very, the palm leaves are very important because that's the palm, because I brought that because obviously this week is Palm Sunday, and there's... um, Oh, that's that picture there. There you go. We'll put up on camera three again here. Yeah, so they use those palms. Today, you know, we get palms every year, right, for our church. We, Mm -hmm. where do we get those palms from? One strand. They come from Autumn. You get them from They come from Autumn. You order them by the box. (laughs) (laughs) The largest grower is in the Everglades in Florida. That's where most of our palms come from wow. today. Yes, and like they're grown, actually not grown in Gatorland. Not a date palm tree. They're just palm trees. Palms. Right. Like so. coconut palms? Are there no, there's a, there's a special kind of palm, and I don't remember the name Let's of them. Get other palms. Yeah, you'd have to do a little research. Where do we get our palms? And mm-hmm. there's a name for them, some kind of palm tree. But I can do that. But palm, why, why did they, you know... I have to read you a scripture. Maybe you can guess where it's from. It says, Rejoice heartily, O daughter Zion. Shout for joy, O daughter Jerusalem. See, your king shall come to you, a just savior. He is meek and riding on an ass, on a colt, the foal of an ass. He shall banish the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The warrior's bow shall be banished, and he shall proclaim peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Sounds like a prophecy. Yeah, it says from Zechariah. Chapter 9. See, I didn't even cheat by looking. I closed my eyes because I was trying to. <laughs> like, I don't think I it's totally Isaiah. Cheated. But the reading this week is we're going to read the, the at the beginning of uh, Palm Sunday Mass. We read the gospel, right? The entrance into Jerusalem and Jesus riding on an ass. So this is fulfilling that prophecy, obviously. But palms were used all over. Palms, palm leaves were used for a lot of things. They were used to award people. They were made uh, the rings on uh, a lot of Roman emperors wore them. Uh, athletes wore it. Lots of references to palm. So I came across palms like, where are they most prolific at? And I found out that they are just covered in the city of Jericho. Mm. So Jericho, as we know, is the oldest, is, is a lot of people think that's the, it's the oldest found city on the face of the planet. They have found an a organized city there from 11,000 years ago which is amazing, and they keep finding layers and layers, but it was really the first formal city, I mean, where people gathered, and ag- they, they see signs of ag- agriculture and just an organ- organized city, you know, and for 11,000 years ago, you think 11,000 years ago, there was a city in this, they have found a city in Jericho, and that word, Jericho, means fragrance. Mm. Could mean two things. There's, there's two, two routes you can take. A lot of people think the Hebrew word for Jericho is fragrance, or it could mean moon. And 
Those are pretty divergent. Yeah. Yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they are. So the reason that they think it might be moon, because there was a Canaanite moon god, and Jericho oh. was the site of, of pagans in the early days, and they think that that's my, where that word came from. But the Hebrew word for Jericho is fragrant. So why is it fragrant? Because of the balsam trees that were prolific and the date palms, the sweetness of the dates. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, Jericho has just got date palm trees everywhere. So it's just pretty interesting to see that city. And we all, all know got conquered, right, the blowing the trumpets. And it's still there today. It's it was right on the fertile crescent on the on the ancient fertile crescent, um, and it was really the only organized city in the area. So you didn't, they haven't found anything close to that in age wise of how old it is. So it's pretty pretty interesting. Interesting. Um, so Jericho is also known as the city of dates. So all uh, you single ladies. I was going to say <laughs> second. To Where did that come from? <laughs> dates. Beyonce. Why do they call it a date? Why do you go on a date? Why do you go on a date? I don't know. I want because to because they are so sweet. Somebody find out why. Why they? I was going to find that out last night. So let's go on a date. So what does that mean? Because you're sweet. Could be. Could or be. Or you have to set a date and a time in order to meet somewhere. I don't know. I don't know either. You got there me. Are a lot of palm trees. Available. So I'm going to Psalm 119 now. Okay. okay. So this next two weeks we're coming into, you know. A lot of stuff going on, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> so last week we had the raising of Lazarus, and we talked about that. This week we have Palm Sunday, and there's a lot of references in the Old Testament to what's going on this week. And obviously I just read a prophecy from the Old Testament. And Jesus at the Last Supper, we know that that's a Passover meal. And, you know, I'm getting ready for our Seder meal that we have on, on Tuesday of Holy Week every year. And it's always, it's always fun to go back and relive that because you're actually just diving into your ancient heritage of, of the Jewish faith. And when we read the Last Supper, Jesus, Jesus it says they sang hymns. A- after the third cup, they sang hymns, and he went to the Mount of Olives. And that's part of the Passover meal. And, it, and we've talked about this before, but, you know, there's four cups in a Passover meal, and Jesus only drank three cups. And then it says they sang hymns. Well, what hymns did they sing? Well, they, they sang the Psalms 116, and 17, 18, and 19. And if you go to there, if you go to Psalm 119, this might sound familiar to you too. It says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone by the Lord as it's been done. It's wonderful in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Lord, grant salvation. Lord, grant good fortune. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So that's pretty, we, we've heard that before, right? Oh, a few Isn't times. Funny? Yeah, so mm. at, take, it takes me right to Mass, right before the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer, when we kneel, right before we kneel, and the priest says, with all the throes and dominion and the angels and the archangels, what do we say? We say, Hosanna in the highest, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that's where this word, grant salvation, verse 25 of Psalm 119 says, this is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice in it, and be glad, Lord, grant salvation. Grant salvation, that word is Hosanna. Oh, so basically, wow. it's Lord Hosanna, and Hosanna basically means save. I pray. Mm. It means grant us salvation. It means save. I, I like save. I pray. Just save us, Lord. And it's it's kind of like they're asking for deliverance. If you read the beginning of this psalm, a couple of verses before it says, "The joyful shout of deliverance is heard in the tents of the victors. The Lord's right hand strikes with power. The Lord's right hand is raised." I shall not die but live. The Lord has chastised me harshly but did not hand me over to death. Open the gates of victory. I will enter and thank the Lord. This is all what Jesus is doing here coming up next week. It's everything he's doing. So these psalms that were sang during the Seder meal is a song of deliverance. They are singing the psalms because the Jewish faith, obviously, were waiting for their Messiah. So they have a first Passover meal that they have, which was a perpetual institution that they had to have every year. And after 70 AD, they quit sacrificing lambs, so they lost their temple, so they didn't sacrifice lambs anymore. And we talked about last week the, the sheep gate where they brought all mm-hmm. the sheep in and how Jesus entered that gate last week when he healed when he uh, healed the blind man at Bethsaida and then he uh, walked in through to get Lazarus. He also walks out that gate to Gol- Golgotha. Mm-hmm. 
So he is that lamb. We, we, you know, we see that reference. John, John says, behold the lamb of God. Well, Jesus was that lamb. Jesus, there's so many references to Jesus in the Old Testament. So we'll see in a, a few weeks after Easter how the road to Emmaus, where Jesus says he opened up their eyes to you know, the scriptures of all what was written about him. And that was obviously everything in the Old Testament points to him. So when we read in the context of the Old Testament, we need to read with, through the eyes of Jesus. Of it, Everything is about him. He, we read about in Leviticus about the scapegoat. Every year there's a scapegoat that the, they put all the sins on the scapegoat and they lead them out into the desert. So who does that sound like? Jesus was the scapegoat. He takes on those sins. So I always was curious, though, with all the prophecy in the Old Testament, why didn't they get it? Well, why don't we get it? Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But, I mean, we've had... I mean, would we really? I mean, we, we obviously have 2,000 years of yeah. knowledge, and we can see everything going on. But... To be in that know, moment, though. I mean, even in this reading, in this reading, we're not going to read all of this this week, but when you get... When you look in John at at when at the, you know when Jesus walks in, there's a there's a couple verses that we that we read but we skip and it says, and and the the gospel the first gospel reading this Sunday you know it says Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord the King of Israel, and that you know all what I just read from right. the Psalm and it says, fear no more O daughter Zion see your King comes seated upon an ass that's called his disciples did not understand this at first. But when Jesus had been glorified, they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done this for him. So the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from death continued to testify. This is why the crowd went to meet him, because they heard he had done this sign. So this is just right in the same week that Jesus gets Lazarus. So when he's coming in riding on the colt and they're laying the palm branches mm-hmm. down, this is a sign of victory, and Jesus is victory over death. And most of these people that were there... We're witnessing Lazarus' resurrection. Okay. But then the big sign here is, and you just kind of addresses your question. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. But they did. They haven't. But the reason that they didn't see him is because of their pride and arrogance. Mm. And that's why we don't see him. Mm-hmm. You know, yesterday I'm sitting there thinking about stuff like, you know, I got in an argument with somebody yesterday, and then I... Sat back and think. Now, why did why did that ha- why did that argument happen? It's because of my pride, or I want to cover my butt. You know, I, I want it's about me, right? And then I realized I said, oh, Lord, you know, and I just started reading some prayers to try to get that to go back to humility because we all fall into that. So we don't see Jesus every day. We tend to get consumed by our fallen nature, and and the same thing was going on then. Even though Jesus is right in front of him, Jesus is right in front of us. Yeah, Jesus is more real to us right now than us standing there watching what's going on and riding on a colt. So we tend to forget that. So it's not that hard to not see this whole situation because they were arrogant. They were prideful. They're mad because they see, they saw Lazarus get raised from the dead too. Mm-hmm. And then they went and told their leaders, and they're like, and then what did they do? They just, well, let's kill him. Right. You know, that's the answer here. We're going to kill him. That wasn't the answer, obviously, but that's what we do. We kill Jesus in our hearts. When we, and then you guys, the previous segment, you guys were talking about conscience. conscience. Well, we kill our conscience. We have a dead conscience. So we no longer see Jesus. We don't see Jesus in other people. All we, when we get caught up in our anger and our hate and our self-indulgent nature, we don't, we don't see the good in other people. We tend to see the bad that's in us, we see them in other people instead of pulling the good. You know, it's a lot easier to build, to, to uh, break down than build up. Um, you know, and I, I've talked about the, before about my son building the Titanic, you know, spending five days building Titanic with Legos and my d- three-year-old daughter comes up and kicks it over in five seconds. You know, you, you, you playing you, the part of the iceberg tend- today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you tend to, you, you, you don't understand. It's, 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 it's hard to build up yeah. the kingdom of God. It's very hard. And we get nailed down every single day by di- distractions in ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that's our job, though, is to build the kingdom of God. What are we, what, what's, what's our purpose in life? Our purpose in life is to glorify God. And then that, that in tunes gives us a peace. And we just don't live in peace anymore. We, yeah. we don't have peace in our hearts. We get caught up in all the news, and we forget that, that our president is not our king. Okay, Jesus is our king. And we tend to think all these little distractions are in the whole picture of things. We need to understand that the peace that Jesus brings causes divisions. 
And we right. tend to go, well, I don't want to stir the pot and I don't want to trouble the water. Well, Jesus came to trouble the water. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand if we have true peace and the truth is in us, which we have the Holy Spirit in us, we're going to trouble the water just the way it is. And right. we have to be happy about that yeah. because that's what we're called in life to do. Right. Troublemakers. We are called. Yeah, we Why are. should we eat dates? What? Why should we eat well, dates? Well, they're... Obviously, they're delicious. They're <laughs> delicious. They're they're uh, highly nutritious. They're a great replacement for sugar. They take on different. I mean, you can use them to make different things. I mean, like I made a that Ranjinak cake for you a couple of years ago, and the, it's almost all dates, but it tastes like chocolate. Yeah. So you can, it really takes on different textures and flavors, and and in nutritionally, it's just really naturally good for you because there's nothing there's nothing fake in it. It's just really good. Yummy. Would you leave us with a blessing, I please? I would love to. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen, and God bless us all. All right. Amen. We will take a short break here. Be back with our Lenten prayer and reflection after this. Are you struggling to find a way to spread the news about your upcoming event and reach more of the Catholic community? Salt and Light Radio would love to support your effort. Click the public service announcement tab at our website, saltandlightradio.com, and we can help you design, record, and produce some fantastic public service announcements. And best of all, they're free. Salt and Light Catholic Radio. Change your station, change your life. Bluebird Express Car Wash is proud to support Salt and Light Radio. Named top 20 best employer in Idaho, Bluebird's ever-growing team, along with world-renowned custom equipment and free services, will ensure you have a car wash experience like never before. Three Boise locations, Overland Road, Fairview and Cole, and now on State Street near St. Mary's. Opening soon at Eagle and Overland and in Caldwell. For locations and information on unlimited memberships, the website is bluebirdexpress.com. 741, 37 degrees in Boise, 31 in Twin Falls with some snow flurries, 30 degrees up on Grangeville's Camas Prairie. Time now for our daily Lenten reflection and prayer. Found in the Little Black Book, available at your parish, or go to littlebooks.org. Tuesday of the fifth week of Lent, from Matthew's Gospel. When Pilate saw that he was not succeeding at all, but that a riot was breaking out instead, he took water and washed his hands in the sight of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. Look to it yourselves. And the whole people said in reply, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But after he had Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Pilate washes his hands. Once again, we have the haunting trail of innocent blood. Pilate is trying to wash away his own responsibility. His words to the crowd, look to it yourselves, echoes what the chief priests and elders said to Judas, look to it yourself. It's the old story of trying to avoid personal responsibility for something I know deep down isn't right. Trying to rationalize guilt away is useless. I go nowhere, and the guilt still haunts me. Some of the wrong things I do are not entirely my own fault, but they're partly my fault. There's no point in identifying the guilt of others if I do not flat out acknowledge my own. Remember the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector? The tax collector stood off at a distance and would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and prayed, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's not one of us who can't say that sentence with utter honesty. So say it, then sit in silence and listen to the Lord's response. Traffic and weather are next. Sultan Light Radio thanks Beacon of Light member Capital City Heating and Cooling for their support. With over 50 years of combined experience, they're dedicated to providing efficient solutions for your family's home comfort. Clients are treated with integrity, and it shows from the high ratings and recommendations on Google and Yelp for customer satisfaction. Located at 420 North Curtis Road in Boise, the phone number for Capital City Heating and Cooling is 208-345-4115 and the website Capital City heating.com good morning light traffic so as you're making your way on the freeway after you merge politely there at 10 mile things are going to be slow particularly as you're approaching meridian road 
Once you get past Eagle, though, things are going to open wide and you're going to get uh, anywhere you need to go without too much of a problem. Uh, once you're uh, off the connector to downtown, it is slow just kind of getting through that initial light or two. Chinden slow in all of its usual spots as well as 55 in Nampa. So please drive carefully. Turn your lights on. That's your morning light traffic. Cloudy in the Treasure Valley today, then a rain-snow mix tomorrow and Thursday. Highs around 50, overnight lows in the mid-30s. Magic Valley, cloudy and mild today with a high near 50. Then scattered rain and snow tomorrow and Thursday. Highs between 40 and 45 degrees with lows 30 to 35. Much of the same for the Camas Prairie. Cloudy today, rain and snow tomorrow and Thursday. Highs mid-40s, lows mid-30s. 37 out in Fruitland right now. 29 up in Cottonwood at St. Mary's Parish. Mountain Home reporting 33 degrees. We'll take a short break to learn more about our Saint of the Day. When we return, we'll wrap up this terrific Tuesday with Catholic Counseling. This is Franciscan Media's Saint of the Day for March 28th. Today we celebrate St. Catherine of Bologna. Artists find a patron in today's saint, a woman who served the Lord in obscurity as a member of a semi-monastic religious community. Catherine was born in Bologna, Italy, in 1413, well-off and well-educated, she developed a special interest and talent in painting. Years later, as a nun, Catherine spent time doing manuscript illustrations and painting miniatures. At the age of 17, she joined a group of religious women. Several years later, the group became part of the Poor Clares. As a young sister, she worked as convent baker and portress. Later, she served as novice mistress and finally as abbess. Whatever her role and responsibilities, Catherine had a reputation for holiness and many spiritual gifts. Wherever she lived, she drew young women to join her in the poor Claire life. In addition to her major work, Treatise on the Seven Spiritual Weapons Necessary for Spiritual Warfare, Catherine is credited with writing 12 poems, 11 other brief treatises, and two letters. Her writings are thought to have played an important role in the understanding of the late medieval vernacular. Catherine died in 1463 and was canonized in 1712. There's more about the saints along with inspiration and Catholic resources at our website, saintoftheday.org. From Franciscan Media, this has been Saint of the Day. Morning Light now brings you Catholic Counseling, where we've assembled a panel of experts to help Catholics maintain good mental health. Enjoy today's session. No appointment needed. 747, 13 minutes away from 8 o'clock as we wrap up Morning Light with Catholic Counseling. And from St. Mark's Catholic School, we have Sarah Lynch joining us. And today discussing fixed mindset versus growth mindset in dealing with students. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. Good, Good to see morning. you guys. Growth mindset is such a hot topic in the educational universe. Yes. It's, I it's have the never buzzword. Heard of it. It's oh. the buzz, buzzwords buzzword? out right. there right oh. now. Right. Yeah. So what does it mean? So mindset is made up of our beliefs, ideas, and our attitudes. Right. Um, and I'm in the classrooms this week talking about fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Fixed mindset. Um, People feel that their abilities just are what they are and they can't be changed. For instance, um, a person may think that they're bad at math, so they don't even try at math. Or a person feels that because they're smart, they don't need to work very hard. And in either case, when a person fails at something, they just decide to give up. Uh, people with a fixed mindset avoid challenges because it makes them feel like they're not talented or smart. And they lose interest when the work gets hard and they give up easily. Now, at school, we're trying to encourage growth mindset. It's kind of those we can do hard things, hard things are what help us grow. Uh, that mindset is, is the idea that, you know, we can always learn new things if we put in enough effort. Um, we can always grow. We can always change. We embrace our mistakes. Um, we learn from them, and we try new ideas instead. And people with a growth mindset seek and thrive on challenges. They want to stretch themselves because they know that they will learn and grow. Um, this is hard. This is fun is more of the attitude that we're trying to teach kids, kind of that love of learning. And that goes hand in hand with teaching kids resilience. So that's I, I went into one of the classrooms yesterday, and I started out my lesson um, with origami. And they thought, oh, this is going to be so fun. And I just handed them a piece of paper, and I said, okay, um, for the next two or three minutes, I want you to try to create a penguin with the piece of paper, the origami paper. And it was very, very interesting to see the response that I got from the kids. Some were silent, and they were 
you know, trying it one way and when it didn't work, they opened the paper back up and tried it again a different way. And then I had other ones that were like, I can't do this. I, I've never done origami. This is way too hard. And I didn't say anything about fixed mindset or growth mindset, but it was very interesting that that's exactly what you saw. You saw those that were up for the challenge and those that were ready to give up right away because it was, it was hard. So, you know, that kind of started my lesson. And then at the end, I taught them how to make the penguin with origami. So sometimes are these kids maybe just a product of their environment? Because I know, you know, when I was growing up that, well, you're just that way. You know, because you're tall, you play basketball. Or because you're this, you're that automatically. So are we kind of sometimes conditioned by our environment to be either fixed or growth? Yeah, sometimes. Um, you know, going back to that example of the basketball player, we were just on spring break and we were staying at a hotel and there was a very, very tall, large man at the hotel. People assumed he was a football player and many people went up. We heard conversations like, is that your dad? Is he a football player? You know, kind of that just the assumptions. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we're trying to go in and teach kids and then also teach parents like what can a parent do to help their child and encourage the growth mindset. Um, one of the first things is is praising the process. And I, I'm, I'm guilty of this one. We say to our kids, you're so smart. And it sounds like a really good compliment. But what that's teaching kids is either you're smart or you're not smart. And that if, if you have to put in effort, then that's a sign of weakness. And then when they encounter difficulty, um, they tend to feel like, oh, well, I guess that means that I'm not smart. And instead, you know, and I've, I've done this the same thing with my kids and with my students. Instead, we need to praise the process and we need to say, you know, point out specific things. Good job hanging in there when that was challenging. Um, nice work finding a different strategy to get to that. Uh, good effort, you know, that's something we can all benefit from and something that we can all praise kids for instead right. of just saying you're smart or you're not smart. That's where it goes back yeah. to that label. We try to always use the word capable. Mm -hmm. We know you're capable of yep. achieving more. Mm -hmm. right. And if we can help you with the process, right. please let us know. <laughs> yeah. right. It looks like you worked really hard on this. That's uh, a really good one. Good. We did. I've done a lot of reading about math mindsets because mm -hmm. I had a daughter I have a daughter who struggled with math, and I read all of Joe Bowler's books, and I read very specifically about math and about math mindsets and, and all of that, and I was totally sold on, you know, and, and I am sold on anyone can do math to the highest degree, because mm -hmm. that's what Joe Bowler says, and people can look her up, she's at Stanford, and if, if you're willing to work hard enough, yeah. and they were like, there are no math people, which was tricky, because I have a math kid. I have two non-math kids, if yeah. you will, if we want to put people in boxes. And one kid where math just comes. He, it just comes. He gets patterns and formulas, and the numbers all make sense, and they all line up for him. It's just the sky opens and the angels sing. <laughs> and everybody else, it's just dun, dun, dun. Another one bites the dust. That's the theme for math. Yeah. So it's, it's just so interesting to encourage the kids who have to work hard, and then they watch the little brother past them mm -hmm. mm. so it's it's it was tricky in our journey because yep. i was all in and i realized okay it's not quite as black and white as we thought so right. as parents we really as you're saying praising the effort because i know for you that was really hard work yeah for him it was easy but for you and i'm talking about you good job because you really sweat over that problem yep yeah yeah definitely um you know the other thing for parents um when you're talking about your day, instead of just the open-ended question, how was your day, we can ask, and I, I've not, you know, I, I'm guilty, I've never done this before, but did you make a mistake today, and what did you learn? Um, what did you do that was difficult today, instead of just how was your day, what was the great things about your day? And then you can talk through that process of when I found something challenging, or when you found something challenging, how did you make it through? Um, we want to remind our kids that, that the brain can grow. And if you persist through challenges, your brain is always growing, always learning. Think about adults. I mean, this is a silly thing, but like I do Wordle. Wordle in the morning stretches your brain. Sudoku stretches your brain. We're always learning. We're always trying to grow our brain. Um, there's two more important things. Uh, and one of them, it really resonates with the kids when you say that failure is okay. Kids think failure is not okay. And it, especially um, with those that are sports oriented, we go back to Michael Jordan. And, you know, he didn't even make the varsity team when he was trying out in high school. He was on the JV team. 
I, I show a video, um, kind of an inspirational video for them, where Michael Jordan says, you know, I missed over 12,000 shots in my career. I lost almost 300, or I lost 300 games. There were 26 times I was trusted to take the game-winning shot, and I missed. But failure gives me strength. Failure, failure gives me drive. Um, and then the last important thing that, that I'm teaching in the classroom is the word yet. I can't, I can't do a cartwheel yet. I mm. can't make... You know, I can't make a three-point basket yet. We're putting yet at the end of it. So we're trying to take the, the negative connotation and turning it into a positive. And that's something parents can do. So what age group are we talking about starting this? And once they get to be middle school, high school age, is it too late? I don't think it's too late. I, I'm too, so I'm in the classrooms this week doing K through five okay. with this. Now, I'm not using such big terminology with right. the little kids, but kindergarten and first grade, it's the big yet. We're reading a story about this giraffe that can't dance. Um, and so he figured. I love that book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so then he figures out a way, right? And so then they're going to write down and they're going to discuss things that they don't know how to do. And then we're going to put the word yet at the end of it. There's a whole Sesame Street um, song that they're watching. It's called The Power of Yet. Um, I don't think it's at, at, at any point it's too late. You know, it's not even too late as adults to try to change that mindset. Whew, that's good news. <laughs> yeah. It is good news. Well, back to the failure piece. I was reading about how when you fail and then you learn from it, mm -hmm. what actually happens physiologically in your brain and I thought that was pretty amazing. So in, you know, in our school setting, if they, you know, make a big mistake and then they learn from it, mm -hmm. I'm like, look, your brain just grew. Uh. And they roll their eyes. You know? <laughs> but, but that's what it is. It's like literally your brain grows, the physiology in there, the cells are making new pathways. We talk a lot about the brain and how, how hard things, they're just the bulldozer through the mountain. When you do it that second time, then you're laying the pavement. That third time, now you're going over it in your car. But that first time, is it's hard because you're just chiseling away at the stone. It, we find that a lot with piano. You yeah. know, learning oh. that new piece, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're just, you're bulldozing. Just keep bulldozing. Because yeah. the second time you do it, it'll be easier. That's where the whole, the whole idea of mistakes, like, it's okay. And sometimes... Your your biggest mistakes can become your biggest failures, like you or not your failures, your biggest successes. You know, sometimes you have to get through that to realize there's a different way, there's a different path, there's a different avenue. Um, we're also talking about a lot of language, like different words to use. Instead of saying I'm not good at this, try thinking, okay, what am I missing, or or what's a different avenue to go about doing this. Kind of like if Plan A didn't work, there's always a Plan B. Um, Instead of saying, well, my friend can do it, but I can't, we want to fix that language and think, I can learn from my friend. My friend can do it. What can I learn from them? Um, instead of saying, I'll never be that smart, we can say, I will learn how to do this. Um, instead of saying, I just can't do this, I'm going to train my brain. And that kind of goes along with, with the math and the book that you were talking about. Instead of saying, I made a mistake, we want them to start thinking or saying to themselves, mistakes help me learn. Um, this is too hard. We want them to try to start thinking, this may take some time, but I can get through it. So it's trying to, trying to change the terminology and the language that they're speaking to themselves, but also out in the classroom and as parents. So. Right. All right. Fantastic. Um, so great. Are Thank there you. any resources that parents can tap in or places um, to go? There's tons of articles online if you okay. just Google growth, or growth mindset for students, growth mindset for kids, growth mindset for adults. Um, focusing more on the growth mindset portion of it instead of the fixed mindset. But there's lots of articles out there. There's lots of um, webinars. There's lots of videos that you can watch to, to get a bigger understanding of this as well. Excellent. And do your Wordle. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much. That was great. Yeah, thank you. That's going to wrap up Terrific Tuesday. Later today, go to saltandlightradio.com, click the Morning Light page, and hit podcast if you missed any of today's segments or previous programs. Please watch the show live on YouTube. You can still follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You can even send us an email. We would love to hear from you. Morning Light at saltandlightradio.com. We'd like to thank our guests today, John Keenan and Mike Turner, Deacon Chef Lou Aaron, and Sarah Lynch. Tomorrow, Faith and Feast with Teresa Zapetta, Pat King, and Eddie Trask will bring you Man Cave and our new segment, The Bountiful Harvest. So join us for a wonderful Wednesday edition of Morning Light tomorrow at 7, St. Maximilian Kolbe. 
pray for us. St. Catherine of Bologna, pray for us. St. Gabriel the Archangel, pray, pray for, for us. us. Aren't you proud I made it through the whole day with no balloons?